Take a look at this. You guys are going to love this. Here's your Yahtzee moment for the night, guys. Guys, what? who in the chat knows? Who in the chat knows why graphene? Why is graphene the secret sauce? This is a good one, right? I'm out here just spitting facts for you guys. This is going to make you impress your friends, especially your scientific friends later on. Because everybody knows graphene is some dope thing. Why is graphene so special? Why does graphene allow free energy or whatever else we're having? Yes, because it is one layer thick. That is a good point. But it's more than that. The electron drift velocity. The electron drift velocity of graphene is super high relative to something like copper, where the electron drift velocity of copper is very low. Remember, if you drop your magnet through your copper tube, it goes super slow. Graphene has a very high electron drift velocity. Now imagine, remember, the Doppler effect. If two things are speeding away from one another, the waves will either compress, depending on if they're coming together, or if they're moving away, they stretch out. So this effect is what allows us to get non-relativistic or relativistic. How do they refer to it? Relativistic motion. So we can now get speeds that are from a relativistic perspective, from the perspective of the electron itself, very, very high. And when we get to these super high relativistic speeds, this is where we start to break the laws of physics. So this is me just explaining at a very basic level that anybody can understand. Why is graphene? So awesome. Electron drift velocity, number one. Why is that important? Because the faster your electrons are moving relative to one another, now you get relativistic motion. Now you can get super high speeds. Now we can basically start breaking the laws of physics from a relativistic perspective. Because all of us are in our own little bubble all the time. And time is always moving at a constant rate in our own little bubble. And that's also true of the electrons. The electrons themselves are also experiencing time dilation. And so this is why we want this relativistic motion between them. This is why graphing is so important. And now that I've said that, let's take a look at this scientific paper one more time. What does this say right here on page four of David Kirkley's Helion Fusion scientific paper about a neutronic fusion for commercial purposes? Beyond simple heating by uniformly distributed ions, field reverse configurations also have large parallel electron drift velocities along the magnetic field. Because the electrons are highly magnetized and can freely move along internal flux surfaces throughout the FRC, both axially and between the core and radial edges, this transport results in uniform electron temperature throughout the FRC. Oh, boo, yeah, sweet sassy molassy. That's your Shaquille O'Neal breaking the backboard right there. Boom. What is going on? How are we making our free electron laser in our fusion reactor? That's how. The electrons are moving freely around, along the axial path. And what do we see happening along the axial path in our orb videos? We see the X-rays coming out. We see the X-rays coming out because we're pre-ionizing the air in front of the orbs. And then imagine there's a tube inside the plasma orb. And the electrons are able to flow back and forth relativistically like this. That is your free electron relativistic X-ray laser. The fusion reactor is producing the X-ray laser on the inside because of the field reverse configuration. Now, if I'm wrong and it's not exactly a field reverse configuration this is still the same mechanism if it happens to be a theta pinch or a dense plasma focus they're all very similar concepts i happen to think that it is field reverse configuration exactly but the only person that could tell us that i would trust would be david kirkley i want to hear directly from david kirkley or maybe somebody at tri alpha energy because 
I got a weird feeling that these guys have seen that like in their experiments, they've seen something that, you know, looking at those videos are like, uh Oh, <laughs> uh Oh, <laughs> imagine you do some experiment in one of these fusion companies and you're making these like balls of plasma. And then you see like, you know, a specific heat signature or something in there. And then you see the MH370 videos and you're like, Oh shit. <laughs> you see those videos you're like, Oh man. Uh Oh, something, something's going on here. Right, like you'd probably be spooked. I'd be spooked. And also, by the way, guys, I do recommend if you are using AI, it's actually pretty solid now. If you have it reference the scientific papers that I talk about on my Twitter, in whatever question you're trying to ask it, and it will be probably pretty accurate. I mean, you don't have to limit it just to stuff that I talk about. But if you, a lot of people ask me like, where can I find the science and stuff that you're talking about? Right, like. Realize we live in a world with AI. AI can do the heavy lifting for you now. So just be like, hey, cross-reference the scientific papers and Ashton's Twitter posts, blah, blah, blah. Boom. Trust me, you'll get good responses. Well, obviously there's a connection between UFOs and nukes. What is the power source of your UFO? Even if I'm wrong, even if, you know, if UFOs are real, their power source is nuclear energy. Nuclear energy just means the atom splitting the atom fusing the atom they're working on the smallest possible scales and they understand the universe better than we understand it because we can't even see things that are super tiny i mean we can see things that are pretty damn small at this point we're getting really really good our material science has been advancing over time one thing i want to address is this crash argument i actually heard it yesterday as well saying that sneezing monkey saying isn't it absurd that the aliens could be super advanced, but then crash. Not really. Everything crashes. Things fail. Things go poorly. There's actually a lot of explanations for why they might crash. And just like a surfer, it's kind of like saying that a surfer could never fall over. Of course, a surfer can fall over. They've learned how to surf on a wave. It doesn't make them invincible. That's the same idea as when we're manipulating we're making gravitational waves. You're using electromagnetism. So if you get hit by some electromagnetism, it's going to knock you off. It's going to knock you and balance you. So I, I think that there is obviously some connection between nuclear weapons and UFOs. The energy source is the connection. But also you could then, if Knuckles was correct, if, if uh, Lowell was correct, Lowell Wood, if those guys were correct, then nuclear weapons were manipulating space-time. And if that's the case, then that's like throwing a speed bump on the highway. You're like, you're throwing a speed bump onto the highway. People are trying to fly around here, bro. People are trying to fly around with our warp drives and you're nuking things in the sky. It's going to mess things up. In fact, there's other scenarios as well. Just today, I was seeing this, uh, the twin universe theory, which is one that goes way back. Imagine that on one side of our reality, there's an alternate reality the exact inverse of our reality. It's a weird idea, but it's possible. If we are nuking things and we are manipulating the bridge between these realities by adding, removing this huge amount of energy, then that may show up on their side as well. So there's a lot of different ways that nuclear weapons could be impacting UFOs. 